Welcome to another Instagram Live. We took a one week break and I hope you enjoyed it. It's the middle of the summer and yet we have all of these worries. We still have coronavirus worries. We still have economic worries, lots of economic worries. We still have protest worries. Uh, there was all these shootings in Chicago. There's the Upper West Side of New York is having problems. Actually, I want to talk for just one second about the Upper West Side in New York. And welcome, thank you for coming to the IG Live. And we're here in Florida. We, at first we thought we made a mistake. We came from New York City to here, and suddenly the epicenter of the coronavirus went from New York City to Florida, which sucks. But New York City is a total shit show right now in a way that's both disturbing and even funny. So we live in the Upper West Side of New York, and the Upper West Side of New York, the mayor, I guess during the pandemic, took many of the homeless people that were in the touristy areas and moved them into hotels in the Upper West Side. And only in the past few weeks, it seems, people in the Upper West Side realized this happened. Now, we knew it happened because we saw it happen, but other people didn't. Uh, but what's funny is there's this huge group now on Facebook that's so upset about what's happening. And, 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 and there's like 3,000 people in this group. And so I joined the group just to see what they were saying. And everybody was like, we've got to make signs and protest at City Hall. We've got to protest. De Blasio has to listen to us. He owes us. Which was an interesting use of language. Yeah. Like, why do they think he owes them? Because they donated money? Ah, uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Well, it turns out the owner of the hotel also donated money to de Blasio's presidential campaign, a, a, a campaign that everyone knew was gonna lose. So who does de Blasio owe more? Yeah. But just the fact that, like, okay, I'll explain what I did. So finally I made a comment on this board and I said, I don't think that a bunch of well-to-do white people protesting in front of City Hall is gonna be you, trying to get all the homeless minorities out of the zip code, I don't think that's gonna be a good look for you guys. And maybe you should consider something like, I don't know, talk to liquor stores to not serve alcohol to anybody who's drunk. And I looked at a whole bunch of suggestions. And some people responded, and they were like, this is great, this is great. Do we form an LLC to do this? Like, how do we do this? And I'm thinking, you, what, who are you people? Like you're lawyers, doctors, you're supposed to be like educated people and all you can think about is petitions and LLCs. And, and then I mentioned how the hotel owner had donated to de Blasio's campaign. And they were all like, well, we can sue, we'll take this to court. It's quid pro quo, and, you know, like, like Trump. And I'm like, you were just saying that de Blasio owes you, now you're saying quid pro quo. And by the way, the Sixth Amendment has been suspended in New York City. Like, there's no right to a speedy trial anymore. Like, teenagers waiting to get sentenced or be released can't even get a trial. How are you, why would you get a trial? So, I, I stopped posting in the group. But I noticed even today, you know, the New York Post did some article about them, and they were like, you know, why, they called me rich. I'm, I, I worked my ass off for this. Like, everybody was so, like, irate and upset. Like, look, you can't, you know, I don't even know what to say. It's, it's a mess and I'm not, I'm not commenting any further except that it just, something about the whole thing seems funny to me <laughs> and that's all I can say. Uh, someone asked, what's going on with opening up the schools? And I just wanna give a couple of thoughts on this. I get it, Robin gets it, I think. We have five kids between us. When our kids were little, if there was any hint at all that anything bad could happen to our kids in school, then certainly we wouldn't have sent them, except for the fact that something bad, I mean, just remember when you were in junior high school or high school, I mean, at least for me, I was constantly getting beaten up. Now that's different from death, I get it, but anytime you send your kid to school, there's risk. And I'm not suggesting send your kids to school, by the way. The CDC is suggesting send your kids to school. 
So the who is unsure, but the CDC says definitely send your kids to school. And by the way, I don't listen to them either. Make up your own mind. Don't listen to the CDC. They've been wrong over and over again throughout this crisis. So we don't know. They always seem to have an agenda. But let's just think about it. Right now, so far in the United States, something like 64 kids have died in the United States from coronavirus. And most of those kids had pre-existing conditions or autoimmune conditions. So certainly if your kid has a pre-existing condition or an autoimmune condition, try to figure out some alternative to school and I'm sure the schools will be welcoming to that. Let's also not forget the schools are gonna be very serious about hygiene and social distancing more than they ever have been before. So that will reduce the risks. A lot of these new cases with kids have happened in the summer because kids are playing around with their friends or they're going to summer camp. So it could be the case that going to school might lessen transmission. Kids do get the virus, but very few, and kids do go to the hospital with the virus, but very few die. 64 deaths out of 166,000 deaths. 64 deaths out of 380,000 cases of kids. So there's been 5 million cases of adults in the US and 166,000 deaths, uh, which is about 0.3%. And out of 380,000 kids who have had cases, 64 deaths, that's not even one, t it's that, that's 0.001% or less. Like that's a very, very tiny percentage. And again, you could have eliminated a lot of those if you, were, if you um, quarantined uh, kids with autoimmune disorders or other pre-existing conditions. By the way, the flu kills about 200 kids a year. So this is coronavirus for kids is one third as strong as the flu for kids. So it's much weaker than the flu for kids. So, and again, you have to ask, we don't know the data on this, but how many kids have died because they were home? Hopefully, I hope, I hope it's not 64, but certainly there's been less education for a lot of kids, particularly in, in lower income areas. There's been a lot more child abuse, sexual abuse, uh, other uh, diseases unrelated to coronavirus that kids have died from. So it all has to be in perspective. And I guess if I had a choice and I had to send my six-year-old or seven-year-old or eight-year-old to school, I probably would. Uh, again, I wouldn't want them, well, other than the fact that I think school is worthless, particularly if my kids were from first grade to sixth grade, that's where they learn how to be social with other kids, then I probably wanna send them to school. If homeschooling was an option, I would probably homeschool as long as there was a chance for them to be social and have play dates with kids. But I don't know, if they were in high school, I certainly wouldn't wanna send them to school, but that's because I really don't believe in high school. Mm. What would you do? Would you send their kids to school? Yeah, I would. Why, why is it, like is there any? Uh, because I think that they're, they're fine. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to risk that, that. I mean, the numbers are smaller than the flu and we send them to school with the flu, unless they have symptoms or unless their best friend has symptoms, then they might, I don't even, I've never sent my, kept my kid home even when their best friend had symptoms. Right. So. No, I mean, and it has to, you know, people just have to make that choice. And kids can get it from adults. Like adults now are, you know, it, 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 it's, it looks like a little downtrend in the past two weeks, but adults have been still getting, you know, lots you know, cases. Yeah. Most kids that get it, again, 380,000 cases, 64 deaths, um, and you know, that's compared to 5 million cases, 166,000 deaths for adults. Most kids who get it are mild to asymptomatic. So yes, I would send my kid to school. And by the way, I think even though there's no medical evidence for anything, um, and I'll get to Putin's vaccine in a second, uh, you know, there is, I'm constantly reading research reports, we're constantly talking to doctors, we're constantly talking to epidemiologists and other types of doctors who nobody is, everybody's afraid to say anything because it's been so politicized and no, I'm not gonna talk about hydroxychloroquine, I'm gonna talk about aspirin. So apparently this virus, they, uh, there's been a bunch of studies done, apparently it ca causes blood clots and they're afraid it causes micro blood clots in the lungs and that's the reason why 
many patients uh, get low on oxygen. So what um, prevents blood clots? Aspirin. So nobody is saying this works, nobody is saying it doesn't work, but it's definitely not bad. Give your kids baby aspirin every day. I don't take aspirin, I don't think I've ever taken aspirin in my life, but maybe I should. Maybe aspirin is a decent medicine for this. Also, there's some evidence about vitamin D. When we spoke to a doctor, we were worried uh, at one point that Robin had it, she didn't, but we were worried and a doctor suggested massive doses of vitamin D and vitamin C. So, all these things, without getting into weird supplements, because I could recommend those as well, all of those things, there's a lot of evidence and research already that shows vitamin D helps, vitamin C helps, uh, maybe aspirin helps. I'll give one recommendation given to me by David Sinclair, who is the author of Lifespan. He's been on my podcast twice. He's been on Joe Rogan. He's been on a, a billion podcasts. So because we know that diabetics are affected by coronavirus more than other people are, and we also know, thanks to David Sinclair's research at Harvard and in the book Lifespan, that anti-aging medicine is often derived from anti-diabetes medicine because sugar causes a lot of inflammation and, and causes the body to age faster. A, a lot of the supplements that he recommends in Lifespan, I've been taking during this period. I don't know if it's helped or not. No one's ever done a study on this. I'm just telling you what I take. And so particularly, uh, David Sinclair in Lifespan and on my podcast and the second time on my podcast when we were talking about the pandemic, he recommended um, NMN, Nancy Mary Nancy, and he takes it for anti-aging, but, uh, but he takes it now for anti-coronavirus as well. So for what it's worth, maybe there's a kid's dose, but certainly your kids could take vitamin C, vitamin D, aspirin, keep kids with autoimmune disorders home, and Night, you know, out of all this, again, very few kids have died. 19 states have had zero deaths among kids. So I would look at, I don't know which states where it's clustered, maybe avoid, maybe think twice there, but even then, there's, you know, 50 million kids in the country, 64 deaths. Your kids, if it's a healthy kid, eats well, sleeps well, takes some of these supplements, the odds are so small, it's like one in a million. Now, I'm not recommending anything, I'm just saying I would send my kid to school if I needed to, if, if I needed to get to a job and I couldn't take care of my kid. Because look, another way kids are gonna suffer is if their parents can't work. So, um, I'll, just, I'll, go to, I'll go straight to another question. Um, please tell Robin, thank you for the IIPR recommendation. Oh. <laughs> so IIPR, you want to explain what it is? Uh, yeah, it's a REIT. It's a... Um, What's a REIT? It's a, a, a company, I guess, that goes and buys real estate. And then um, this particular one, though, uh, buys property for cannabis uh, for growers. Yes, they buy land that you can grow cannabis on. And eventually, I don't know, Biden's like against legalizing pot, right? I don't think Trump said anything one way or the other. Eventually, marijuana's gonna be legal. All marijuana drug felons that are in prison are gonna be released. Marijuana should be legal. They should start, you know, there was, uh, there was starting to be some evidence that marijuana is good for epilepsy, marijuana is good for uh, uh, re symptoms of chemotherapy, it's good for anxiety, it helps you sleep, it's good for glaucoma. We knew 30, 40 years ago it was good for glaucoma and, uh, but they can't tell, you can't do any scientific test because it's been like a schedule, whatever, illegal drug. It's gonna be legal in the US. It's legal in Canada. It's legal all around the world. It's gonna be legal in the US. IPR is gonna to continue to grow. I think there's gonna be, you know what? I think there's gonna be another uh, growth wave of cannabis stocks. You know, they all kind of went down. I agree, yeah. But how do you avoid the scams? Well, you just have to do your research, you know, find out where these people came from, what other companies they've been with, um, how long they've been in business, I, I don't know, you know, well, all the... Well, uh, one marijuana company visited me a few months ago, and actually a year ago, and all you gotta do is go Google all the past companies they were involved in, see what happened to them, and if there's one, even one instance 
where they got in trouble or they had to pay a fine for the SEC or they did something that made you distrust them, then just don't invest. And if they're too small, don't invest. Sometimes too small, you think, oh, I'm getting a deal. No, everybody has looked at your deal and they're small for a reason. So if it's too small, that's an area where the industry is gonna grow so much that every company right now is still small, no matter how much the stock has gone up. So don't be afraid to invest in any of these, just to invest in good companies and use the Warren Buffett rule, which is if it's gonna be here 20 years from now, it's probably a good investment now. And that might mean they're big, it might mean they're small, but use that as your criteria. Will this company be here 20 years from now? And is the CEO and the other investors not crooks? So that's that. Um, by the way, I wanna just address two things, Biden and Trump. And this is not, this is not gonna be political. It's more from a game theory point of view. I just wanna talk for one minute about Biden and Trump. Biden, who knows if I'm right or wrong, I think Susan Rice, who was the former UN ambassador under Obama, I think she'll be the VP pick. The reason is, is because Kamala Harris and Joe Biden hate each other. Yesterday, I don't know if I told you this, yesterday there was a rumor that Kamala Harris had unfollowed Biden. So her, her odds in the prediction markets went straight down. But then it turned out she had never followed him, so then it went back up. Oh. So Susan Rice and her switched. But I do want to say, Oh, he, Biden locked himself into a corner. So there's gonna be history in that it's gonna be the first African-American to ever be nominated for a major party ticket like this, whoever it is. But no matter who he picks, he's gonna have a problem. Kamala Harris, he hates, and she didn't win. You know, she, she, you know they fought in the primary. She has a really weird DA record against African-Americans. Susan Rice has all sorts of problems with, I don't know if this Obamagate turns into anything, but at least Trump, we know Trump is gonna use that. So Susan Rice was involved in that, plus she apparently lied during the Benghazi stuff. So even though I'm currently betting on her to win, I might, I'm up on the bet, so I might take it off before the end of the day today, just to take my profits. Then who's next in line? Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, she supposedly visited Biden last week. She's a complete failure as a governor in Michigan. I don't know, there's no water in Michigan. Detroit is in shambles. There was protests and riots all throughout the coronavirus, like why she could be possible. That's a great example of failing your way all the way to the top. She might fail her way to the presidency. So, and then we're in big trouble. So he's not gonna pick Gretchen Whitmer. He was just doing that for show. He's not gonna pick Elizabeth Warren because as much as she claims differently, she is just too white. He is not gonna pick Elizabeth Warren. And he, even though Biden is pretending right now to be have much more liberal policies, he's just pretending. So he can fool everybody who yeah. wanted Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. So I don't even, Tammy Duckworth is a congresswoman. He's not gonna pick her. Uh, uh, everybody else, Karen Bass, was calling Fidel Castro El Comandante, so he's not gonna pick her because he wants to win Florida. Um, Keisha Lance Bottoms, the mayor of Atlanta, he's not gonna pick her since there's been a bunch of shootings in Atlanta. He's screwed no matter who he picks. But the good news is for him is that the vice presidential pick seldom has an effect on the presidency. Isn't it? Typically. Typically. I mean, it might be different this year. But like I mean, Biden certainly did not help Obama win the presidency and Dick Cheney did not help Bush win the presidency, only cheating did. And Gore didn't help Clinton win the presidency. Gore and Bill Clinton lived right next door to each other, Arkansas and Tennessee, so he held nothing. Um, I don't know, Dan Quayle certainly didn't help George Bush win. Uh, George Bush didn't help Reagan win. Oh, well, maybe a I little think bit. Didn't, <clears throat> did they have typical, you know, cognitive issues like Biden? Reagan had Alzheimer's. But did he have it then? It didn't seem like it. Maybe in 1984 he did. It's hard to say. He did have the classic I... quip, where's the beef, to Walter Mondale. Oh, oh, this was the, what Reagan did. The, the, Reagan was a great... They, he, he was great in these debates. I don't know if, so, if someone wrote these lines for him, but when he made, so he was running against Walter Mondale, who, as you all know, was Jimmy Carter's vice president, and this is 1984, 
And he started off the first debate saying, I just want everybody here to know that I do not want to take advantage of any unfair advantages I might have. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to take in, I, I don't want to, you know, insult my opponent's youth and lack of experience. Because Ronald Reagan, the big criticism against him was his age. Mm -hmm. So he turned it on its head and that was the end of that criticism. So that was interesting debate point. Now, Trump, let's talk about this for a second. He signed four executive orders this weekend. And as they might have good intentions, I don't know, but clearly he's trying to signal that, you know, to the voters, and he actually went up in the prediction odds a little bit, He's trying to signal to the voters that, hey, I'm thinking of you guys, let's get this stimulus going. But I just wanna go over the orders really quickly because zero of the orders meant anything. And, and it's, I, I looked at CNN, I looked at Fox News, I looked at MSNBC, I couldn't find any articles that were at, like the, the day of or even on the weekend, maybe by now there is, but I couldn't find any articles that actually explained the orders and what the legality was. So I had to go to whitehouse.gov, get the actual text of the orders, and then start looking at the law. So order number one was the uh, extending unemployment. The only problem is, he, he's, he, he, this is the one order that might be the closest to working. He's not using money that normally is used for unemployment, he's using FEMA money the problem is, if all the money is used for all the people who are currently buying for unemployment, it could run out in just five weeks, as opposed to December, which he claims. Mm -hmm. The other problem is, is how is he gonna get the money to people? Like, it has to go through the state unemployment uh, system, which is not so easy, particularly since he's requiring that the state contribute to it, which they might bend on. Well, haven't they already been doing that, though? They did it. And remember, it took a couple weeks to start. But it's, 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 it's a machine now, right? Well, not quite, because they are requiring that you have to be collecting at least $100 a week already from, un from state unemployment to uh, qualify for new unemployment. But don't forget, all the people who originally filed for unemployment, their state unemployment ran out already. So this, they would have to open up the state unemployment for this new federal thing that's not even coming from you know, the department that normally gives unemployment. So it's unclear, and they're still negotiating because he's requiring the states to put up 25% of the $400. It's unclear how long it's gonna last. Obviously, he was using this to signal to voters that, hey, I'm thinking about you, and he's also trying to do this as a negotiating stance, but we'll get to that in a second. Number two, eviction relief. He basically said nobody could, eat, could be evicted. So in the CARE stimulus, it also said nobody could be evicted, but this, just an executive order about, like, let's say I had a tenant. I can still evict the tenant. Who was gonna stop me? Like, Okay, but even if he did it versus Congress, even if Congress did that, how could they do that? Well, if Congress did it, then it's against the law to not enforce Congress's laws. It's not against the law to not enforce, like, like the police, if I tried to evict you, and we were still under the CARES Act, which we're not anymore, you could call the police and stop me. But you can't, there's no law that is gonna prevent, is, is gonna help let you call the police. So, and actually the way his eviction moratorium is worded, it didn't say no evictions, it said we will consider how we can do this and how we can find money for eviction relief. So it actually doesn't do anything because it would require over a hundred billion dollars. There's not like an extra hundred billion dollars lying around the government that, oh, we just found a hundred billion dollars. Why didn't we use this before? We, we forgot to give it to the Kennedy Center, so now we can give it to... I, mean, I think, I feel like he's just putting out things that are really important to him and to the people. Yes, but... Okay, because I'm, it's all, it's all been, you know, uh, I guess the Congress has put in a lot of different things that they want, and I don't know... Yeah, I mean, who knows? I don't know what the negotiating is like. Like, both sides are saying something, so it's like he said, she said. Clearly, they failed to come up with a deal. Both the Democrats and the Republicans, they're both, they're all idiots. Nancy Pelosi is worth $400 million. Donald Trump's worth, I don't know, negative $5 billion. And neither of them can come to a deal uh, to help 
poor people just, who can't pay their rent. Right. So I wish you they know, could just do just that. You but we just take care of the people that need the money now, that need their homes. Which, which I think is what Trump was trying to do, maybe. But the problem is now, if the Democrats just call his bluff, which if I was Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer, I would just say, okay, go do what you said you're going to do. He can't do any of it. Like student pay, he can't do a payroll tax cut. It's a, he did an executive order, payroll tax cut. That's the IRS. He could enforce a payroll tax cut if Congress votes for it, but it's the law that employers have to deduct so for social security. So it's basically Congress that's stopping. Well, right now, but that, that's his negotiating stance, but they never, it's not that they're stopping it, is they never agreed to a payroll tax cut. Even the Republicans didn't want a payroll tax cut. So it's just, he made this order out of thin air. And by the way, maybe he had good intentions or maybe he's just trying to use this as a negotiating tactic. But again, and what's an employer gonna do? You have to deduct for social security or it's a crime. So they can't listen to the executive order because then they're breaking the law. And there's no way this, there's no constitutional, sometimes there's a constitutional basis for these things, but there isn't in this case. Ditto for student loan relief. Which so, I think is great that he did that. I mean, I hope that goes on forever. Yeah, but you know, we'll see. Uh, the Congress has to pass a law still. So, um, let's see what we got here. Oh, uh, so that was the problem with Biden, and that was the problem with Trump. I think it's going to backfire on him, and I and I hope it doesn't delay a real stimulus. The other thing he didn't backfire do backfire on Trump. Yeah. Because it, because the because the Congress could just say okay you did it that's just their, go ahead but that's it. Congress so it's going to backfire on Congress because they didn't negotiate and they because they want all this other stuff maybe so it's ridiculous that they they're holding up everyone I mean people don't have money to eat but they're wanting to pay for libraries or whatever. I agree I don't know. so he didn't make executive orders about the stimulus checks and that's what people really need so hopefully they respond I mean, to that just be that right now so uh, uh, oh. I just want to talk about the stock market for a second. So I talked about the problem with uh, keeping kids home, talked about the problem with Trump, talked about the problem with Biden, problem with the stock market. S&P 500 is hitting all time highs today, but you have to understand why. This is really important. This is neither good or bad, but it's important to understand why. The S&P 500 counts bigger companies more than it counts smaller companies. The top five companies, they are up 36% on average this year. The other, the other 495 companies in the S&P 500, as a group, are down. So only five, out of the five companies out of the whole S&P 500 are soaring to these amazing highs. Now, some other ones are too, but you have to remember, as a group, the bottom 495 on average are negative. Even though some are up, some are down, the, the entire mark, stock market, people are always asking, why is the market disconnected from the economy? And I've given other reasons before, but a very important mathematical one is that the stock market is always disconnected from the economy because it's always right now dependent on Facebook, Amazon, Google, Netflix, and Microsoft, and that's it. Those companies are up, the stock market's up. The other 495 companies are up, may or may not be up, so uh, the stock market. So we'll see. Um, uh, somebody asks, somebody says to me, I want to write a book on dating and romance from a Gen Z perspective. Would you, re would you review my manuscript upon completion? And the answer is no, because then everybody, I would have to review a million books. I have a lot of people who say, hey, can you just t check this out? And even with my good friends, I usually just return it and say, I don't, I can't do it because I don't know, I put so much energy into my own writing. It's hard for me to do anything else related to writing. That said, I would check out a Gen Z romance. I have no idea. Like, do any of our kids even date? Well, John does. John does. But he's had a girlfriend since he was 16. Yeah. He's 21. So he's, he's almost like weird. He's like an outlier. <laughs> But we have four daughters. I don't know what they do. Like, I have no clue. And Lily's dating. She's dating? 
Ah, oh, see, mothers know everything. I don't know anything. But so, I'm, okay. I'm curious about how they date, what's the role of like all these other apps and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It just seems to me dating right now is different from dating from when we were kids. Right. Oh, for sure. Like what's different, do you think, from your perspective? Uh, I guess the way you meet people, typically you would just meet people in your little world. Yeah. Right? I mean, now you can meet people from all different walks of life. Through apps? Through apps. Are there apps just for kids? Oh, I have no idea. Maybe they meet like on TikTok? Oh, gosh. Because Facebook kind of... My kids, they, yeah, they, they met through high school. When well, that's how, we, that's how but, kids yeah, met when yeah. we were kids. So, yeah. so what do you think is actually different right now? Do you feel like relationships are different? The way they treat relationships? I think so. Yeah, they're not as traditional, maybe. In what way? Uh, a lot of kids don't want to get married. They, or, you know, they, um, I don't know. I mean, they just seem to be a lot more independent. Yeah, I think that's true. So that's good. That's a good thing. Um, which reminds me, in, in terms of the word traditional, of a business idea of the day. What was the, guess what the top trending terms were on Pinterest at the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020? Okay. Uh, Non-binary clothing. So people wow. need gender neutral clothing. Now, I don't know if that's a huge part of the audience. I don't know if it's a big fashion trend, but it was the top trending term on Pinterest. Mm -hmm. Another trending term uh, uh, recently has been tie-dye. So like it was actually, there was an article I think in The Atlantic or New York Magazine, mm -hmm. how tie-dye, like people are even tie-dyeing suits and everything. Yeah. So combine, set up a store on mm -hmm. Shopify, combine gender neutral clothes. Look, I'm wearing like Maoist pajamas. <laughs> combine gender neutral clothing. You're getting ready for, to live in the communist world. Yeah, I'm getting ready for when AOC is president. <laughs> combine gender neutral clothing. And tie dye I should be tie. Where's Lily? She should be tie dye yeah, my right. pajamas. She does a good job. So, and then learn how to set up. This is I said this before. You're going to need two types of skills: hard skills, which are anything technical, it could be programming, it could be setting up a blog, it could be managing an Instagram account, it could be setting up a Shopify store, or soft skills, which is anything relating to telling a good story, like marketing, sales, negotiating, storytelling, creating content. So, if you could learn how to make a Shopify store, a Depop store, a Poshmark store, an Etsy store, eBay, use Instagram for shopping, use Pinterest for shopping, if you could do all of that, someone asked me how would I go about making $2,000 this weekend? I would just go to four stores in the neighborhood and say, I'll set up the 10 stores you need to set up and I'll maintain it for you for a couple hundred bucks a month and, or maybe even less, maybe 20 bucks a month, who knows? That's the way I would make $2,000 in a weekend. If you're a high school student or even if you're an adult and you wanna start a business, you could charge higher prices, you could uh, look for trending words to help them place uh, the right products per store and whatever. So that's, that's, uh, that's that. Oh, I have another idea. I have another idea. Okay. So, this is this I think is a fun idea, and it could be used for a newsletter or a podcast or whatever. But look at look at the top trending Reddit subreddits on Reddit. So you know, Reddit is like this giant message board on the internet, and the, and like everybody ranging from the dumbest people in the world to smart people throw in their two cents on comments on Reddit and then people upvote and downvote. So one of the most popular subreddits is uh, the Reddit slash movies. So if you click on that, you get all these, you could do a podcast just about, or you could do a newsletter just about the topics in the movies subreddit. And they're pretty cool. Like here are the top trending ones today. Like what is the best film you watched last week? We're, we're watching one right now, um, The Old Guard on yeah. Netflix, which is kind of like a mix between The Highlander and The Justice League or something, or Highlander yeah. and X-Men. It's like people who live forever, who, uh, but they're not trying to kill each other, they're trying to help the world. Right. So, um, and then you can, we could do a whole thing. We also watch The Hustler and The Color of Money. So you can imagine doing a whole newsletter, what's the generational differences between mm -hmm. 
acting in The Hustler and acting in The Color of Money or in The Old Guard. Um, did we see any other movie last week? Oh yeah, we saw that uh, Cary Grant one, North by Northwest. All right. Which made me think of Northwest Kanye West. Here, um, oh, here's another topic in Reddit slash movies. This is fascinating. Do you know there is one last blockbuster? Did you know this? No. So all the blockbuster, of course, is out of business, but there was one, you know, they made, for people who don't know, they sold movie DVDs for Gen Z people who don't know what a DVD is. Um, and there's, I think it's in Washington, there is one last blockbuster. Huh. So before Washington secedes as a state, you can actually live in this blockbuster because they're posting on August 17th, they're gonna start posting them, their, the space on Airbnb. Oh, so you could like live in the last blockbuster, the world's last blockbuster. That's hilarious. That's pretty genius. Yeah, that's how they're gonna make money instead of sell, selling movies. They lost that business, but at least they could get Airbnb rent. Um, uh, let's see. By the way, I did a, uh, an experiment a few weeks ago. I, so DNA Films, which is this production company run by this guy, Nick Nanton, he did a eight series, eight part docu-series about my book, Choose Yourself. It's airing, it's being released on Amazon on August 14th, which is tomorrow. I think it's being released tomorrow, unless, they're, unless they miss it. But a few weeks ago, July 18th, they released it in movie theaters, there was one movie theater chain open, and because so few movie theaters are open, it was 18th in the country in box office. So I, uh, you're married now to a guy who was, you know, kind of starring in a top 20 movie in the country. So just so you know, I know I do these Instagram lives, but I'm a big <laughs> movie star now, so uh, that's why I get to wear pajamas all the time. <laughs> So, uh, I don't have any other, I don't have anything else. Yeah. I'm done. You're done? I'm done. I, was there any other big news? There was an explosion in Beirut. I have no idea. Oh, Putin, he said this morning, the, the head of Russia said the, this morning that he, in Russia, they created a vaccine and he gave the vaccine to his daughter. Mm -hmm. I kind of think his daughter is probably dead right now, but other than that, you can't, I'm, and I'm not anti-vaccine, by the way, power to it if he makes a vaccine, but you can't test a vaccine. You, it takes like a year to do a phase three trial of a vaccine. No matter how fast you're doing, there's no way for him to know if this vaccine is really safe in the long term. He could have only have been testing it for a few weeks or, or two or three months at the most. There's no way to test if it's safe. So will I take a vaccine when one's available? Of course. Will I take this vaccine? Of course not. So don't take the Putin vaccine, no matter what anybody tells you. And, um... Yeah, the vaccine thing, it's just, like, how are they gonna, you know, how can they tell if it really works? I mean, they're not gonna infect people with it, which is, is sort of what they're talking about in the UK, like, a moral, I, you know, I discussion don't... about should we infect people so that we could see? Yeah, they will, they, uh, that's what they'll do. They'll get volunteers and they'll pay them and they'll have a control group people who won't be infected, and they won't even know, they'll be double blind, and they'll have another group, people who will be infected, they'll give everybody the vaccines, and they'll see if there's any difference in COVID infections between the two um, populations. So they, they feel okay about that, just infecting yes. somebody? Yes, yes. Now, I don't recommend they do that anyway. for, I don't recommend they do that for medicines when someone's on a ventilator, like don't make, don't give anybody a placebo, but for vaccines, they'll definitely do that. All right. Well, you would just think that maybe they could find somebody that's just, tested positive so that they don't have to add enough more people to the... Maybe they will. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, how did they test polio? I wouldn't want to risk my kid being injected with polio. I think they didn't test. I think this is the whole problem when you start to get into the anti-vax space because mm -hmm. then vaccine companies don't have the same standards for litigation in terms of suing them. Mm -hmm. So Especially that's now. when we get into RFK Jr. space, which he is the only person who's ever been on my podcast where I did not release the podcast. The 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 infamous RFK Jr. podcast uh, that, that I could not release. I mean, this is a guy who saw, saw his father shot and killed and his uncle shot and killed, and he's firmly convinced the FBI killed both his uncle and his father. He's probably right. He could be, but one thing that all conspiracy theorists have in common, two things they all have in common. Number one, 
If you believe in one conspiracy, you believe in another conspiracy. Number two, at some point in your life, a major institution of your life, whether it's parents or school or the government or whatever, has betrayed you. Mm -hmm. So for RFK Jr. watching his uncle and his father die uh, by what he feels is at the hands of the FBI, he feels the US government you betrayed him. And so it's all about trust. Yeah. He's, um, he's batshit crazy. So I hate to say it. But um, anyway, thanks for coming to this IG Live. It'll be released as a podcast and we'll be back on Friday. Tuesdays and Friday, send questions or give feedback or suggest topics to 203-590-8607. 203-590-8607. By the way, I've been taking beatboxing classes for the past three months. I'm almost to the point where I could beatbox in front of her. So, <laughs> thanks very much, everybody. Yeah.